So I have a question. Um, Jesus is called the Word, right? Why is that? Have you ever wondered why he's called the Word? John wrote, we read it already, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and then we're told in verse 14 that, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son of the, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Why was Jesus called the Word? Is there a connection between the written word, the Bible, and the incarnate word, the Lord Jesus? Let's think about the expression, the word, for a minute, as John used it in relation to Jesus. I mean, God could have um, used any number of expressions to describe Jesus. I'm borrowing a little bit and uh, adjusting a little bit from uh, John Piper here, but... Um, Jesus might have been called the deed or the work. In the beginning was the deed, and the deed was with God, and the deed was God. But that seems a bit ambiguous. I mean, if we think of our words, if we think our words are sometimes unclear and subject to various interpretations, certainly our deeds, our works, are far more ambiguous. In fact, sometimes it takes words in order to explain what we did. Um, words capture the meaning of what we do more clearly than the deeds themselves. We often need to explain again why we did what we did and why. God did many mighty deeds in history, but he gave a certain priority to the word. Let's try another possibility. How about the thought? In the beginning was the thought, and the thought was with God, and the thought was God. One of the differences between a thought and a word is that a word is generally pictured as moving outward from the thinker for the sake of establishing communication. John wanted us to conceive of the Son of God as existing both as the sake, for the sake of communication between him and the Father and for the sake of appearing in history as God's communication to us. The thought just does not communicate what we need to understand. Third example would be the feeling. In the beginning was the feeling, and the feeling was with God, and the feeling was, was God. Feelings are wonderful, but feelings do not really carry a clear conception or a clear meaning. Feelings like deeds are pretty ambiguous and need to be explained. And how do we explain feelings? How do we explain thoughts? How do we explain works? We explain them with words. We use words to explain all of those things. Calling Jesus the word was John's way of, ex of expressing or emphasizing the very existence of, of the Son of God in the flesh for the sake of communication. He exists and has always existed from all eternity for the sake of communication with the Father, but more important for us, the Son of God became divine communication to us. So calling Jesus the Word implies that he is God expressing himself. He is communicating to us who he is. It makes sense, does it not, that Jesus is described as the Word. So the Word is Jesus, and the Word is the Bible. Both are expressions of God to us. Now let's start with what the Bible says itself about the Word, then we'll look at what the Bible says about Jesus as the Word, and then we'll try to connect the dots. So I've, we're going to see if we can figure out how do we connect the idea that God, Jesus is the Word, the Bible is the Word, and how they intersect. Here's what I'm thinking. The, the Word incarnate, that is Jesus, is the final and fullest expression of God's revelation to us. If you want to know what God is like, what do you do? You look at Jesus. The word written, the Old Testament and the New Testament, are given to describe the word incarnate. The reason why we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of that is a revelation of God. Jesus is the exact representation of God. So the Old and New Testament is a revelation of Jesus. And so you have the word written, and you have the word incarnate. 
Now, in the word written, in the Bible, um, we have the Old and New Testament describing to us who Jesus is. That was done prophetically in relation to his first coming. It was done historically as a record of that coming and what he accomplished. And then it was written apocalyptically to provide detail concerning his sovereign future reign. So the Bible shows us, it says Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is here, Jesus is coming back. We have this record of the Lord Jesus contained in this book, the Word, telling us about the Word. All right? Children, you who have your, um, your sheets to fill out, I want you, have you ever played connect the dots when I was a little kid, or connect the numbers, we had these pictures with all these numbers all over it, and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, and you figure out, and then when you get all done, you got a picture. Well, we're going to connect some dots today to try to understand this picture that we're going to be painting. The picture we're going to see as we connect those dots from the Old Testament will be a picture of whom? That's your first question. Two Psalms talk about God's word, what are the numbers of those two psalms? And then what is said about the Bible in those two psalms, what is said about the Bible in those two psalms, could also be said about whom? That's the next question. And the final one is, what word did John use to describe Jesus to his readers? If you get that one wrong, you get to turn in your sheet and no treat for you, okay? So that's the way it works. I'll be real hard up here. <clears throat> okay, so let me say it again. What word did John use to describe Jesus to his readers? Okay. All right, let's start with the written word. God has spoken, and he speaks through his word. Theoretically, we could turn almost anywhere in the Old Testament to see this concept, but I want you to turn to the Psalms, and the first Psalm I want you to turn to is Psalm 19. If you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there. If you don't, grab a Bible in front of you. Psalm 19, David is the psalmist, and he begins with a revelation of God in nature, God's general revelation, and then he moves to God's revelation in words, his special or uh, specific revelation. Let's look at verse nine, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. You've heard me say this many times in the past. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not, uh, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving the chamber, like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. As awesome and as extensive as God's natural revelation is, I mean, all you have to do, look up in the sky. Today, beautiful day, you don't look long, but if you, if you look up to the sun, you see this amazing creation of God. If it's nighttime, you look into the, uh, the heavens and you see the stars. Amazing creation of God. What you see if you look up and you listen would be God's basic general revelation to everybody that's really saying this, God is glorious. Now, one of the problems that people have is they look at creation and they go, wow, that's spectacular. That's not the message of creation. It's God is glorious. Some people will say, well, you know, you really don't need church. I mean, I can worship God in nature. I can go sit in a boat and fish all morning long because there I can worship God. First of all, you probably aren't. Secondly, it's not about his creation. His creation is saying, look at us, look at us, look at us. The creation is saying, look at him, look at him, look at him. It's worship. I'll get off that high horse. Um, I want you to see what the Bible does. It says generally God does this for everyone, but specifically he uses not just his demonstration of power and creation, but he uses words in order to reveal himself. And so the second half of the psalm 
tells us about that, verses 7 and following. First, we learn that his word is perfect, and its perfection, in, in its perfection, the word is able to do something to our soul. The psalmist says that the word of the Lord is perfect, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. It's perfect. Verse 7, it is sure, it's trustworthy, making the wise simple. The word written can be trusted to be true, and by heeding it, we can be wise. We can be wise unto salvation and wise in living, and that wisdom stretches all the way into eternity. So, the word of God is perfect, it's sure, the word of God is right, according to verse 8. Right in that when it's applied to us, it makes us right before God, or in position at least, or in, in, in our relationship with him as far as God is concerned, we are righteous. And it results in the heart rejoicing. Um, certainly, if you understand that you are unrighteous, separated from God, but through Jesus Christ, you are made to be justified, that is declared righteous by him, that ought to bring rejoicing, should it not? I mean, if you have been justified so that now you can be with him, looked upon by him as clothed in the righteousness of God, that is great cause for rejoicing. How about pure, verse 8? Radiant, the result of the applied word is illumination to the eyes and to the heart. Before the word reached us, we were in darkness. Through the word, our eyes are made to see. We see ourselves we also see the Lord and his redemptive plan. Our eyes are open and we see the wonder of who Christ is. Verse 9 talks about the word is clean. It never becomes corrupted or decayed and thus it endures forever. Verse 9, it's true and righteous altogether. For David, the written word, he says, was of tremendous value. In fact, he writes that it is better than gold. It is sweeter than the sweetest honey. Because it both warns us and it also brings reward. It protected David from sin and it established him in, right, in blamelessness, in righteousness. The word written has a profound effect on David's own words and thoughts, establishing those words and thoughts as acceptable in God's sight. So we read in Psalm 19 that the written word is all these things, perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, and righteous altogether. Now let's go of several chapters forward and go to Psalm 119. That's another great psalm that talks about the word. In fact, if you read through Psalm 119, you'll discover that again and again and again, in almost every verse, there are half, maybe five verses or something that don't actually say uh, use a synonym for the word, but all the rest of them do. Psalm 119 is a very interesting psalm. It's an acrostic. Do you know what that means, basically? For example, if you, were, um, if you wanted to remember something, there are how many letters in the English alphabet? 26. Okay. Nice trivia. Okay. So a, B, C, D. Okay. Um, so if you were to write an acrostic psalm in English, let's say, verse 1 would start with the letter A. Verse 2 would start with the letter B. Verse 3 and so forth. All right? Psalm 119 is an acrostic in Hebrew. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The first eight verses, if you looked at a Hebrew Bible, even if you can't read Hebrew, like most of us can't really read Hebrew very well, so if you were to look at a Hebrew Bible, you would notice that all of the letters, in, uh, all the first letter in the first eight verses, all was one letter, and then the next eight verses all began with the second letter, the next eight verses all with the third letter, it's an acrostic. Now if there are 22, who's a math student here, if there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and there are, every one of them has eight verses, then that would mean how many? What's eight times 22? 176, all right? Guess how many verses are in Psalm 119? Wow, 
Is that not cool? Okay, so you have all these, all these things are telling us about the Word of God. It's telling us all about the Word of God. And to help us remember, that's why the psalmist put it in that direction, why he did that as he did. Now, the message of the psalm is essentially this. The message essentially is that the Bible, as described by words such as law, testimony, way, precept, statute, commandment, judgment, word, all of that, he's telling us, is enough for us for life. God's word is enough for us for life. The Bible is the revelation of God to us in words. The, this book is God speaking, and his message is available to all who can read or could hear. And even if you cannot see and cannot hear, some way, if you can feel, somehow you can hear the word of the text, that's God speaking to us. That's God's word. The word written, applied to us, is enough for all we need. Is that true? Yeah, it is. The descriptions of the word in this psalm are amazing. What the word is in my life, and I'm going to run through these like really fast. You don't have any place probably to write these down, but uh, look online sometime tomorrow or Tuesday and it'll be there. All right. So it is, I'm going to run through these real fast. It is water for cleansing, verse 9. It's a treasure for valuing, verses 14, 72, and 127. It's a friend for comforting, verse 24. It's a song for singing, verse 54. It's honey for satisfying, verse 103. It's a lamp for illumination, 105, 130. It is great spoil for the taking, 162. It is heritage for the inheriting, Psalm 1, uh, 19, 111. All those things are true about God's word. Now, how, what are the results from the word? Well, it brings blessing, gives life, provides strength, imparts knowledge and wisdom, creates friends, provides comfort, gives direction. All those things are true at what the word of God does for me. And then our response to the word, what we are to do with the word, the psalmist describes it this way. We are to love it, prize it, study it, meditate on it, trust it, obey it, and declare it. Now, did you notice something that the things that the word written is and does are similar to what the word incarnate is and does? Did you notice? So the word written, as described in these two psalms, if you change that from the statutes of the Lord to the Lord Jesus, it would be the same. Is Christ perfect? Is he sure? Is he right? Is he pure? Is he clean? Is he true and righteous altogether? All those things are true. Jesus to us is water for cleansing, treasure for valuing, a friend for comforting, a song for singing, honey for satisfying, a lamp for illumination, spoil for the taking, heritage for inheriting. Certainly Jesus brings blessing and life and strength and knowledge and comfort and direction. Certainly, we are to love the Lord Jesus and prize him and study his life and meditate on his life and trust him and obey him and declare him. All those things are true. The word written and the word incarnate. Let's look a little more closely at the word incarnate. God has spoken and he speaks. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. Very important passage. First four verses of Hebrews, chapter 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's enough, verses 1 to 3. He is the first installment 
of God's word, if I can say it that way. As wonder-filled as the Old Testament is and as amazing as the manner in which the revelation was given, something now has arrived. Edition number two, if you will, Jesus Christ, God the Son, has appeared and he has spoken. The New Testament is the story of the Son who has spoken, whose revelation of himself is now complete. What we have is all we need for life and godliness. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, think about this. The Gospels are a revelation of Jesus Christ who came to earth. The Acts of the Apostles is the record of his ascension into heaven and the establishment of his church on earth. The Epistles are the record of his work in building his body. And the Revelation is about his coming in power and great glory and the conclusion of his plan and purpose, a plan and purpose that was revealed in the Old Testament scriptures from the very first verse. So the whole Bible is the revelation of God. And how do we know God? It's in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word incarnate, the Word written. Kim Fields mentioned some of your Bibles have the words of Jesus in red. Kind of probably, if we were real careful, all of the words of the Bible would be in red or the same. Because ultimately it is... God's word to us. And he is the revelation, the exact imprint of the very, uh, the, the very vision, the very, the very uh, I don't even know how to say it, substance uh, revelation of God. John MacArthur wrote, the Old Testament tells us in at least two places, in Jeremiah and Amos, that the prophets were let in on the secrets of God. Can you imagine being a prophet of God and God gives you this word and it's, wow, it's amazing. But sometimes when you get a secret, you're not sure about what it means. And so MacArthur goes on, at times they wrote these secrets without understanding them. Apparently that's what Peter was referring to in 1 Peter chapter 1. In Jesus Christ, they are both fulfilled and understood. He is the very he is the, God's final word. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 talks about that. Every promise of God resolves itself in Christ. All the promises become, yes, verified and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the supreme and final revelation. So he has spoken. His revelation is complete. And nothing, nothing more needs to be said. In these recent days, he has spoken to us by his Son. The Old Testament is saying all through that, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. The New Testament says, Jesus is here. The living word has made himself known, but he has been announced at almost every paragraph in the Old Testament. He is the speaking son of God. He has made known the Father's will and purpose. He is the word. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say, we connect the dots from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, from the very end of that, the whole book is a revelation of the Word of God. Incarnate, written, it's the Word. No wonder Jesus was called the Word. It was the declaration of God to us about who He is. His final expression, that's why John was talking the way he did in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here is where we started. In the beginning, the Word, the, that speaks of Jesus' eternality, it all, that he's always existed. The Word was with God. Before anything else existed, God existed. And then the Word was God. The word was the beginning, was in the beginning, and was with God, and was God. That establishes Jesus' identity, his divinity, his eternality. The word was God. The second piece of this is incredibly important to us. The word who is God was made flesh. God becomes man. He enters fully into humanity, and he made his abode here. John uses a real interesting word when it says that he... he um, became flesh. The word, the idea is he tabernacled. Just an odd idea. Uh, maybe a better one that we understand, he pitched his tent here. 
Isn't it interesting that John, I mean, uh, Paul picks up that idea in, in, in 2 Corinthians when he talks about how we, when we come to the end of our life, it's like we fold up our tent. <laughs> and so he said, Jesus pitched his tent in our backyard, so to speak. He came, he became flesh. The exact imprint of God becomes flesh and lives among us. And we beheld, what did John say? His glory. The glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. God communicated himself and his word and his plan and his purpose through the word in flesh. And then recorded the life and death and resurrection of the word incarnate. In a completed edition, Old and New Testaments, of the word written. God has spoken through his word. Isn't it amazing? I mean, can you imagine if you received a direct communication from God? Now, a lot of people talk about that. But can you imagine receiving, absolutely for certain, a message from God to you? You did. Here it is. His word. A revel this tells us who Jesus is. It tells us what God is like. It tells us what God has called us to do. It tells us how we're to live. It tells us how we're to die. It tells us what's going to happen to us for all eternity. That's the revelation of God's word. One writer said, Christ is the final spokesman of God. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and Omega. That means A to Z. Everything suggests that Jesus is God's alphabet, the one who spells out deity, the one who utters all God has to say. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He, Jesus, has made him, God, known. To make known is to tell out. Putting together these passages, we learn that Christ is the one who is the spokesman of God, the one who spells out deity, the one who has declared the Father. Christ is the one who has made the incomprehensible God intelligible. The force of his title in John 1.1 1, 1 may be discovered by comparing it with the names which are given to the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. What are the Scriptures? What is the Bible? It is the Word of God. What does that mean? The Scriptures reveal to us God's mind. They express God's will. They make known to us God's perfections. They lay bare God's heart. That's precisely what the Lord Jesus has done for the Father. A word is a medium of manifestation. I have in my mind a thought, but others do not know what that is. But the moment I dress the thought in words, it becomes understandable. Words make unseen thoughts objective. This is precisely what the Lord Jesus had done. As the, as the word, Christ has made manifest the invisible God. A word is a means of communication. By means of words, I transmit information to others. By words, I express myself, make known my will, and impart knowledge. So Christ, as the word, is the divine transmitter communicating to us the life and love of God. A word is a method of revelation. By his words, a speaker exhibits both intellect and caliber and moral character. By our words, by our words, we shall be justified, and by our words, we shall be condemned. Remember reading that? Our words express who we are. Christ, as the word, reveals the attributes and perfections of God. How fully has Christ revealed God? He has displayed his power. He's manifested his wisdom. He's exhibited his holiness. He's made known his grace, unveiled his heart in Christ, and nowhere else is God fully and finally told out. He is the word, quote. One of the challenges in life, um, I, I'm on, I, I have tried for the last probably 10 or 15 years to, to read through the Bible at least once a year, and I use a reading program to help me do that. And so that keeps me on track of moving through the scriptures. I will confess that sometimes in reading the word, it's easy to say, oh man, I didn't do very well yesterday, and I got a couple chapters to make up, and so I'm going to hurry up and read those. And it's almost like 
in seminary, reading collateral reading, you know, you kind of put it in front of a fan and it goes, foom, 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 and then you say you read it. Don't tell my professors that. But anyway, sometimes we read the Bible almost that irresponsibly. Oh, I got my reading in for today. Well, that's nice. But what did it say? Sometimes I'm brought back to the point where I have to remember that this, this book, is the expression of God. These are the words of God about the living word of God, and they are precious. And all the things that the psalmist said in Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 are true about Jesus, and they're true about the word. When we read the scripture on Sunday morning, listen to the word. Those are words from God. When you open up your Bible through the week and do your devotional time reading the scripture or thinking about or reading other passages that have other um, uh, books, devotional books that have passages for you to read, read those. Pay more attention to this than to the devotional. Think about God revealing himself to you through his book. That's God speaking. When I remember that, I pay more attention. And I should. We don't need to be in the dark about God. He has gone beyond parchment and paper. He's gone beyond recordings. He's gone beyond DVDs and even beyond live drama. He has actually come and pitched his tent in our backyard and beckoned us to watch him and get to know him in the person of his son, Jesus. And when we watch Jesus in action, we see God in action. When we hear Jesus teach, we hear God teach. When we learn what Jesus is like, we know what God is like. I want to conclude with this. We started here last week in Luke 24. Remember this? He said to them, Jesus was talking to the the couple that was on their way home from Jerusalem to Emmaus. He said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Old Testament, he interpreted to them in all the scripture, at that time only Old Testament, the things concerning himself. Later that day, in the room that was secured where a few believers had gathered late in the evening, Jesus appears in that room. And again he speaks. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. The word continues to speak. It's not really new revelation, but it's always fresh. It's not subjective, not left up to my imagination, but objective, clear And if we carefully pay attention to it, absolute. It's not thought or feeling, but words. Divine words, living words, yes, but words. God has given us his word, as it were, in two editions, the word incarnate and the word written, though they both declare the same message. They say the same thing. We weren't present when the word incarnate was here. We have the word written to record his life and ministry. Not only as it was happening on earth, but before in the Old Testament through the prophets. Jesus is the word, the ultimate expression of God. Now, if you don't know this Jesus that we're talking about, you don't know God. There are a lot of people who say they believe in God, but they don't really accept Jesus as the second person of the triune God. If you do not know God, you don't. If you do not know Jesus, you do not know God. Jesus is the exact representation of God. You need to know Jesus. 
We've sung songs today about Jesus coming and dying for our sin. We, we sang songs about, um, I'm forgiven because why? He was forsaken. I'm accepted. Why? Because he was rejected because of sin. He paid the price for me. And when I trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and how do I do that? Through the word. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 when he talked about how, how will they believe unless they hear and how do they hear unless somebody proclaims to them? What are they proclaiming? The word. The word written tells us about the word incarnate, that we might know God, that we might forever be with the one who is eternal, the word of God. We have the word of God. Let's pray. Father, help us to grab hold of this great picture in the Old Testament. The amazing declaration of who you are. Sometimes made in the form of absolute, absolute acts. Creation, the flood, the scattering of the people at Babel, giving of the law. And then we have a declaration of who you are in the law, showing us the perfections that you alone have and the imperfections that are glaring in our lives, how we break law after law after law, and we are condemned by the law. And the message of the prophets again and again calling us to, to look forward to the one who was coming who would pay the ultimate price, the, the once for all sacrifice. And then the declaration of Jesus coming in the flesh. God in human flesh. God who would pay the ultimate price. The eternal one who would die in our place. And then be raised, ascend into heaven and there continue to intercede for us until the day, Lord Jesus, that you come back. All of that, the word, the word of salvation for us, the word de declaring who you are and our desperate need of you. I pray that you would open our eyes to see that and you would help us to rejoice in that. And if those here today, some are not believers in Jesus, that you might take off the blinders and let them see the glory of who you are and the wonder of your great redemptive plan. Thank you for your great grace. Thank you in Jesus' name, the Word.